AL.com also kind of let their liberal bias show with a piece going after Alabama for its lax gun laws. So there's a couple pieces that I wanted to mention, a couple little excerpts out of this piece. And I do actually think, just so you know, before we dive into it, there actually are some really good points in here. Now, the overall tone and the overall, what seems to be the author's conclusion, I think is wildly incorrect. But there are a couple of points that we can take out of this that I actually would agree with. So I want you to sort of listen for those nuggets while I'm reading this. Despite heavy restrictions on funding for gun-related research in this country, many medical and public health organizations believe a public health approach is the best path toward better understanding the root causes of violence. Okay, so there's a lot in that statement that I actually agree with. First of all, there is a restriction, there are several restrictions on funding for gun-related research, which I don't necessarily understand. Now, as far as there being restrictions on different organizations, if it's a spending issue, in other words, you don't want organizations spending money on research for gun violence when their department has nothing to do with it, I kind of understand that. But honestly, the data isn't great for some of these things specifically because there has been a lack of spending. But the answer on uh, to uh, of uh, sorry, the answer to that if you're asking me is to do it privately funded. Because there have been privately funded efforts to get a handle on gun violence and those kind of statistics for a long time anyway. You've got the Crime Prevention Research Center, you have the NRA does some of this, and then you've also got left-leaning groups like Every Town for Gun Safety. Now, because some of those groups have a bias, some of their data is garbage. But the point is, if you have a problem with spending restrictions on the government, the best and simplest solution to that problem, even though I don't necessarily agree with the restrictions, at least in some cases, the best solution to that is to figure out a way to fund the research yourself. Because there are private organizations, whether you're talking about media organizations or research organizations or different colleges and universities that do stuff like this all the time. And so if it is something that is important, and I believe it is, and it's data that I think would be helpful, and I believe it is, then let those organizations take care of it. There's no reason to depend on the government for absolutely everything or to say because there are certain restrictions on the government that, oh no, it looks like there's nothing we can do about it. No, I mean, if you have a problem with that, find an organization that has the means and has the willingness to do something like this and get it done. It's just that simple. But the second part of that statement, the understanding that there's a public health aspect to this uh, is would help understanding the root causes of the violence. I don't think that's entirely incorrect. Now, I am hesitant to full-on sign on to this, because when you start talking about violence as some kind of public health crisis, you're almost excusing it. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about a couple weeks ago with the education system basically coming up with things like the, uh, I don't even remember the scientific name for it, even though I don't think there was a whole lot of science involved in the first place. The, uh, the new mental health disorder that basically encompasses every behavior that every child has ever done in their lifetime, that it would just sort of be an umbrella term to be, if a child is acting up, they have some kind of mental disorder. You, ha you do run the risk of that. You run the risk of these different events in the case of gun violence being dismissed as, oh, well, that's like getting the measles or, well, actually measles is a bad example because there's actually a vaccine for that, even though there aren't some people that are using it now. Uh, that would be almost like saying, well, it's like the common cold. You can't help that you committed gun violence. You run that risk because people can help that they committed gun violence and it is a criminal justice problem that needs a criminal justice solution. Now, the underlying risk factors for said violence, the underlying risk factors for that, for example, if you want to prevent lung cancer, 
you get the word out that smoking can, can cause that and help reduce the risk factor of that. Now, if we're talking about risk factors, I understand taking a little bit more of a illness approach to it, a public health concern thing to it, and, and look at some of the underlying causes to try to figure out why is this happening. That I'm fine with. What I don't like is the implication here, which I think is actually being made, that we should treat gun violence as though it's just a public health crisis. No, people don't choose to get the common cold. People don't choose to get swine flu. People absolutely choose to pick up a gun and start killing people. That's a choice. And because that is a criminal activity, we can't just treat it as though it's some epidemic that just happened to uh, happened upon a city that a whole bunch of people decided, oh, let's just pick up guns and kill people. That's not a disease in that sense. Now, there may be people with mental problems that they're not necessarily in full control of their, their own faculties, where I think that that logic could be applied. And that's typically what happens in the case of a lot of these mass shootings, is that there are people with severe mental problems that either aren't treated or are not treated properly. And so from that standpoint, I think there is actually some value in the statement I'm just careful of going too far, and, and I think that this is the direction that they're trying to lead you in, saying that, well, it's just an epidemic and you can't really do anything about it. Even looking at it from this perspective, which I do think is a skewed perspective, the crux and the stats that this whole article is predicated on don't even really work. Because if you're looking at this article, it says, in 2017 in Alabama... 1,100 people died from complications of gunshot wounds, 573 suicides, 506 homicides, and 21 accidental discharges, according to the Alabama Department of Health. Each of those deaths contributed to the Center for Disease Control, naming Alabama's second deadliest in the nation for firearm fatalities. Yeah, here's the problem with that, though. You're including anybody that died in relation to a firearm. And as you pointed out in your own stats, that of that 1,100 people, 506 were homicides, so about half were homicides. But you've also got 573, more than half, suicides, and then you also have 21 accidental discharges. In other words, the person didn't even intend for the gun to go off. Some kind of accident occurred. So the problem with that is, you're adding in suicides. People that commit suicide are going to commit suicide regardless of whether they have a gun available to them. Obviously, in a gun-rich state like Alabama, where there's a gun practically in every pickup truck, you're going to have a lot more suicides that were conducted by gun. And I do think that it is a, you want to talk about a public health concern, it is very alarming that we're seeing a spike in suicides over the entire country. But that is not a problem of the gun. That is a problem with the person. To prove the point, if you look at suicide rates overall, over the entirety of the world, some of the countries that have the highest suicide rates have the lowest access to guns, including Japan and China. Ridiculously high suicide rates. Even though they don't actually own a lot of guns, they're still killing themselves, they're just using another way to do it. Their suicide rate is, is actually much higher than the United States, even though we have way more guns. And so it's completely disingenuous for AL.com to try to use gun suicides to bolster their statistics and talk about how, well, that's really the reason. Well, that's over half, even more than homicides, is suicides, which would cut your figure in half. And gun suicides are obviously going to be higher in a gun-rich state like Alabama compared to other states that don't have nearly as many gun suicides because the average person doesn't have a gun handy. Here's another thing to consider, and it breaks my heart to report this, but it is the truth. Because Alabama is a heavy military state, in other words, we got a lot of military people right here in the city of Montgomery. We've got two Air Force bases. Suicide rates, especially with guns, are much higher amongst military personnel. And that is a horrible, tragic thing, but you have to realize that that is going to affect the numbers. That is going to give you a skewed view of the stats if you're including suicides as a part of your statistics. So it's just completely dishonest 
Bail.com to use suicides as a way to pad the statistics and try to make it look as though gun violence in the state is much worse than it actually is. To prove my point, got a couple of graphics here to help you really understand this. This is a gun homicide rate. So this is just looking at gun homicides per 100,000 people. Now you will notice, looking at the statistic, that if you're looking at the Deep South, you've got Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, all pretty much neck and neck and all on the higher level of this. But look at some of the other gun-rich states. Vermont has virtually no gun homicides, despite the fact that it's a pretty gun-rich state and it has very lax gun carry laws. You've also got Utah and Idaho that are very gun-rich. Montana, Alaska, Texas, which aren't nearly as much. And then you've also got several states here, like Illinois, that have an awful lot of gun suicides despite having incredibly strict gun laws. Same thing with Michigan. So the problem with this is when you look at it, Alabama is not a massive outlier. It's not as though Alabama's gun policy or its gun laws have created some kind of health epidemic, which is the case that this article is trying to make, where gun homicides and, and killing in the streets, which is the imagery it's trying to, to bring up, is far more common in Alabama than it is anywhere else. It's simply not true, and it's dishonest to make that case based upon a number that is inflated to look worse than it actually is. You're playing with the numbers and putting an image in people's heads that is not equivalent, not accurate, and not true to the statistics that you're given. That's really what's going on here, and I, I do applaud AL.com for including the breakdown of showing how many of them were suicides and homicides, but I'm saying the the way that they're trying to drum up this imagery is disingenuous. But even in the case of gun homicides, homicides aren't even a perfect metric for this because you have to keep in mind that according to the CDC study, again, the same source that is using, that it, their stats are being used by AL.com, that at least three to five times more often than a gun is used for a murder or a violent crime a gun is used to protect somebody. And guess what that gets counted as? A gun homicide. Because homicide is not illegal. There are certain things as justifiable homicide. If a man breaks into my house and I shoot him, that counts as a gun homicide. But it's a case of a gun actually being used to defend somebody as opposed to murder someone. And so even the gun homicide rate isn't a perfect metric. It's a far better metric than suicides, but this idea that the gun homicide rate in and of itself is indicative of a larger problem with gun crime, that's not even necessarily true because a big chunk of the homicides in any given state, regardless of what you're talking about, are going to be defensive use of firearms. And so there is a, a stark contrast there. So I want you to go ahead and look at this graphic, which helps helps you understand this a little bit better. So this is the same map that you just saw on the left of gone homicides per 100,000 residents, so that is adjusted for population. Now, look at that map there on the right. That is the percentage of the population that owns guns. Not percentage of guns themselves, but the percentage of gun owners. How big a percentage of your population owns guns? You see a big difference there? You see... If you're looking up at the top left corner, you'll see that Idaho and Montana and Wyoming have incredibly high rates of gun ownership and very, very low rates of gun homicide. And then you've also got Texas, which has a very high rate of gun ownership and only moderate rates of gun homicide. And the same could be said of Alaska. Alaska has a lot of guns per person and is about middle of the pack on gun homicides. Uh, same for West Virginia, very low gun homicides there. Um, the, the point in all of this is you have a very low percentage in states like Illinois, Missouri, Michigan, and yet you have a moderate to high level of gun, hom gun homicides here. Look over there at uh, Maryland. Maryland has a lot of homicides, 
even though a very small percentage of its population actually owns guns. And so once you compare these maps and look at them side by side, you very quickly realize that there is no correlation whatsoever between the amount of citizenry owning guns and the amount of gun homicides that you have. So this idea that more guns equals more crime and the more people you have, the more lax gun laws you have, the more problems you're going to have with violent gun crimes, it's just not true. By any objective rubric looking at the data, there is no correlation. Now, there is a pretty strong correlation between things like poverty, and there's a pretty strong correlation between things like um, just in general uh, education, access to higher paying jobs. There is a correlation between that, which unfortunately Alabama has an, a very high rate of poverty compared to other states, and gun crime. That's true. But it's a far better indicator. In fact, gun ownership is not an indicator whatsoever of whether or not you have a high level of gun, gun homicides. And uh, if you notice that lack of correlation, um, you will very quickly realize that, that is a, uh, there is a big difference there. So um, let's go ahead and look at this because I do think this alarmism over Alabama's quote-unquote gun deaths, which includes gun homicides, is incorrect. So this is a state, they took a look at the gun homicide rate from 1990 to now. And you will notice that on this chart, Alabama is not number two. Alabama is not even close to number two. Alabama is uh, way far down at number 24. And actually, if you're looking at it, we have a 14.8 rate drop. So out of 100,000 people, we've actually decreased our gun homicide rate by 14.8 since the 1990s. And we're about middle of the pack as far as the uh, decrease in, in homicide rate goes. So if you were to read this AL.com article without proper context and without doing your research, you would think, oh my gosh, gun homicides are just skyrocketing in the state of Alabama. We have a real problem on our hands. But if you're looking at us compared to other states, and you're looking at the relative change in gun homicide rate, actually Alabama is moving in the right direction. And if you'll look at this one, because let's just say for the sake of argument that gun death rate was a reliable source. Maybe we could at least say that Alabama has a real problem with gun suicides, and I just laid out the case for why there's a lot of contributing factors to the gun suicide rate in Alabama not being what it should, and we can always make improvement. But take a look at this graphic, because this looks specifically at the suicide rate. You'll notice even in the gun suicide rate, even when you're specifically just looking at people that kill themselves with guns, Alabama is still on the decrease. We are still 22nd with a 0 0.4 rate drop. So where is this crisis that AL.com is telling us is going on here? By both metrics, even though gun suicide is by no means an argument for stricter gun laws, even if you're looking at that statistic, we're still not anywhere near the top. And look at some of the states that are. You've got some that have pretty loose gun laws, but you've also got, for example, New Hampshire and Delaware. Not exactly Bayesians of conservative thought and Second Amendment lovers. You saw the chart a second ago where they have very, very low per capita gun ownership. So this idea that somehow because there is a, uh, the CDC named us the second worst state for gun deaths. Well, when you dig into the data, it actually doesn't back that up. And when you dig into the data, we're actually on the right track. We're moving down in both of those. Now, are there things that we could do to move even further down? Yeah, I think so. Are there th areas that we could improve, and is this a legitimate conversation to have? Yeah, I absolutely think that's the case. If you want to have an intelligent adult conversation about ways that we can decrease gun violence and decrease gun suicides, I'm in favor of that. But this idea that there is some kind of alarmism that there is some great existential crisis 
on our hands and we have to act now and we have to go ahead and remove everybody's Second Amendment right so that we can get closer to that. Yeah, the states that are doing that aren't having any results. There's a lot of states that are doing that that are actually on, in worse shape than Alabama is. And so if you want to have that conversation, that's fine, but we have to have it honestly. We have to have it based on actual stats, actual numbers. And we have to look at the other states by comparison to see if what they're doing is working. And one thing is very clear, the more you dig into these stats, that gun laws have virtually no effect whatsoever on gun crime. And it has very little effect on gun suicides. Ready access to guns and the ability to exercise your Second Amendment rights doesn't necessarily bring crime down. But failure to allow citizens to exercise those rights certainly does end in a lack of freedom and doesn't do anything to help with your crime stats, which is the reason by any objective measure, it's a really, really bad idea to do. Now I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.